Hello and welcome again to our fourth podcast on immigration. This is Cindy Susana Gomez Shemp. Um, I'm going to go over the requirements for the new programs that were announced recently by President Obama on immigration. And um, I have an immigration attorney sitting next to me, Anna Stenson, kind enough to come back in and help us make sense of all of this information. And I will turn it over to her in just a second, but I want to cover what the two programs are and what the basic requirements are. And um, the first one, of course, is the Expanded Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which is called DACA. And registration is supposed to start today, February 18, 2015. Um, other requirements are you have to have come into the United States before the age of 16, continuously been residing in the U.S. since January 1st, 2010, and had no lawful status on June 15, 2012, as well as been physically present in the United States on June 15, 2012. And you have to be currently in school, enrolled in school, registered for school, or graduated from high school, or you've obtained your GED. And finally, you can't have any felony convictions or any significant misdemeanors or three or more misdemeanors. And turning now to the DAPA program, which is the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans, that program is not available and for applications um, until middle of May. And you also need to have been physically living in the United States continuously since January 1st, 2010 to the present. You have to have a physical presence in the U.S. on November 20th, 2014. No lawful status on that date, 20, the 20th of November, 2014. And also on that date, have had a daughter or a son of any age or marital status who is a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident and have no convictions of felonies or significant misdemeanors or three or more misdemeanors. Did I get all of that correct? You did get all of it correct, except for that as of February 18, 2015, immigration is prohibited by a judge's order from accepting DACA applications for now. Okay, I, I saw something about this pop up on my social media last night and I was like, I just, I didn't even open it. I just took a big sigh and went, ah, so what's happened? Okay, 26 states, including the state of Texas, filed suit in federal court challenging President Obama's authority to um, do the expanded DACA and the new DAPA program. What states would dare to try to stop the authority of the president. Uh, many of those states have Republican governors. Um, and the... Surprise, surprise. The, the judge in Texas issued a temporary injunction, so temporarily stopping USCIS from accepting those DAPA, or DACA applications until he can make a final ruling on the legal grounds for the lawsuit. But it doesn't mean that it's going to go away. The executive order is still in place, and the president and the USCIS are working toward having yep. this program opened. Yes. And so you on the two sides, you have the state governors who are challenging the legality of, of the President Obama's order, and you have the president and the rest of the executive branch of the U.S. government. So President Obama has also announced that he's going to go ahead and challenge and ask for that temporary stay um, to be lifted. And so it's one of those, you know, today you can't file, but there is work in the process for those who support the DACA and DAPA programs um, to be able to let that go forward. Ultimately, many legal scholars believe that the, um, that the judge will find in favor of President Obama so that all of these programs can go forward. Now, you are a legal scholar of sorts. You have studied the law. You are an immigration attorney, are you not? Yes. Now, has, has 
the president done something so radically strange in, in issuing this executive order? Um, is this unheard of? Because people it, are acting like like this is an abomination or something. What's going on? It's not unheard of. Um, since about the 1960s, all presidents have used their executive authority to give guidelines over deportation in the immigration system. All presidents? Have given executive orders? In in recent history, yes, all presidents have had their own enforcement priorities for immigration. So this is not, as people are trying to make it out to be, some strange, you know, dictatorial edict. Yep, and the idea of both the DACA and the DAPA program is to give something that's called deferred action. That's basically recognizing that somebody is here in the U.S. without legal immigration status but giving them the opportunity to work and a guarantee that they're not they're not a high in immigration enforcement priority for deportation. So that executive action has been going on on a daily basis for a long time as well. Um, in terms of, I won't get into all of the details of the lawsuit, but it's an opportunity to challenge President Obama's authority to be doing this. Um, ultimately, many legal scholars and those who have been supporting the DACA and DAPA programs think that they'll be successful in the lawsuit. So it's one of those, again, we were hoping that as of today, February 18th, people could actually start to be mailing in those applications mm -hmm. to immigration. Today they don't. The important thing is you can't file today, but don't panic. It's just going to have to be a little bit more time as the political process and now this court process works its way through the system. Yeah, don't panic. And, you know, for some people that might not have been ready, um, this it, it does kind of buy some time, I guess, because ultimately when the program becomes available, it just gives people a little bit more time, time. to get their stuff ready. Yep. And the other thing that is important, too, is if, if you qualified under the old DACA program. Right. That you, if you qualify for, under the old DACA program, you can still file those applications today and going forward. Mm -hmm. um, that lawsuit doesn't affect the old DACA. Just like if you already have DACA and you need to renew your DACA, you can go ahead and renew. I, again, this lawsuit doesn't stop the original DACA applicants or those original DACA applicants from renewing their DACA status. So I want to actually talk about the application because you, you mentioned that people can renew their old DACA if they need to do that, but you have there are new forms for the new application. Yep, there's going to be a new um, immigration form for the expanded DACA, and then a totally different form for the DAPA application. Right. And as of right now, those forms are not available on the immigration website. Mm -hmm. um, immigration, in terms of the expanded DACA, have published tentative questions and answers addressing some of the requirements for that expanded DACA. But you're not going to be able to have, not until you can file those new expanded DACA applications are you going to be able to um, get those forms. So if, right. you, if you filled out an old form and you think that it's going to work for the expanded DACA, it's probably not going to work. So you have to get the new forms. Yes. Um, what uh, we're talking about today in particular, and I think it's a really timely topic, is getting documents together. Yep, and even though we, you can't start filing documents now, like I said, this is a good time to you know, consult with a professional, whether it's an immigration attorney or another immigration professional, um, to see if you actually qualify for these programs and to make sure that there aren't going to be any issues in you applying. And again, it's a perfect time to start gathering documents and saving money um, and, and trying to make sure that you're ready to go when we can finally file these applications. Okay, so tell me about the new applications and what do's and don'ts people need to look out for. A couple of, of points too is um, try and avoid those people who are not authorized to provide you legal advice on your immigration forms. Because again, if, they, if they're not authorized to give that advice, they shouldn't be giving you that advice and it can actually create more problems for you than actually being helpful to you. 
yeah, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and this is already an issue that is, you know, it's very frightening for a lot of people. They don't know whether or not they're going to be safe through the process and what's going to happen to their family. So it really is imperative to get information from somebody who's authorized, who's certified, who knows what they're talking about. Yep, and it is especially difficult now because every day we're hearing more information and different information. And especially with this new court case, you know, it, it's hard for even those of us who do this every day to know or give an idea of when we're gonna be able to file. Um, another key point is, is that don't just sign blank forms. Make sure that if you're signing anything that it's been completed and that you've verified the information that's on that form. Um, never sign a form that has any false information. You know, make sure that whatever you're signing or whatever you're giving is, is true and correct and honest. Um, never ever present false documentation, especially unless you've ran it by a legal professional to make sure that it's okay to turn over, you know, to immigration. Um, and knowing too, you know, immigration has done enough of these problems, no, enough cases like this where people have to present documentation that oftentimes immigration is very attuned to what papers look real and what papers look right. fake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got a lot of experience. I'm sure yeah. they've been looking at all sorts of different documents that yeah, have been you, faked. Usually, usually I say, you know, they've, they've <clears throat> seen this. They have people who are out there that that's their job is to detect fraudulent documents and, and to figure out where these schemes, you know, are coming from. So sometimes it can be very difficult to trick the system when, you know, they're usually on top of the game of looking for fake documents. And um, I think especially for the people who are going to qualify for that deferred action for parents of Americans, many of them are going to probably have problems actually finding and collecting documents. You know, the children who qualify for that DACA are going to usually have school records, and school records are pretty reliable and pretty easily acceptable. You know, again, it's going to be a little bit more, it could be pro more difficult for people who qualify for that DACA program. DAPA program to be able to get some of those documents that we talk that we're going to talk about. That we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about them. And now, one thing that people need to know about collecting the documents they're going to need for the application process is that the kind of documents that they're going to have to collect for their application is going to depend on what kind of application they're they're submitting, whether it's yeah. for DAPA or for DACA. That you need a different set of yeah. required documents for each kind of application. Yep, and, and the type of documents that you're going to need is actually going to be, in some sense, depend is going to be individualized based on the person and, and when you came and how you came and, and what you've done since you've been here in the U.S. So we can, we're, we're going to talk about, you know, the call it the laundry list of different, of different documents that you can, you, you can see if you have that you can kind of start putting together. But yes, again, you know, when it comes time to, to apply, everybody is going to need something slightly different. Right. And if folks are working with you, for example, you will go over their documents and go, this was a, this is a good one to submit. This not so good. We're going to use these. So you can help people choose and even review documents that might look iffy in case a person doesn't realize that they're submitting something that shouldn't be submitted, that might be false? Yep, usually even if somebody's doing it on their own, they should go and, and try and get all of the documents that they can, and then once they think they have all the documents, to sit back down and say, okay, what do I have that shows this? What do I have that shows my identity? And some documents are better than others. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you don't have the best document, then you go to the next best document, the next best, right, and the right. next best. And so, you know, usually I say gather everything. And then if you come into me, I will weed through and go, okay, we don't need all of this, but let's pick the best stuff and figure out if, if there is something that's missing, where can we go to try and fill in that missing piece? It's always better to have too much to choose from than not enough. Yes, because usually, you know, immigration usually isn't going to complain that you submitted too much. Right. Immigration will have a problem if you don't submit enough or the right types of documents. 
Okay, so let's start with your proof of identity. What what uh, what do we need to gather there? That would be one if you have a passport. You know, make right. sure you have a passport. And you know, <clears throat> if you're from Mexico, you should be able to get a Mexican passport, even though that you're here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, your birth certificate. Right, because the Mexican consulate is making that easy right now. Yep, the Mexican consulate is making getting passports and birth certificates easier for Mexicans who are currently here in the U.S. Because they can go to the consulate and get it. Yes. Good. If, if you have some other sort of national identity document, something that has preferably your name, date of birth, picture, but anything that shows who you are and where you're from. Um, and if you don't have a passport and you don't have a national identity document, you know, do you have some sort of school ID? Um, did you ever go to school in the U.S. and get some sort of ID that even has your picture on it? Um, if you have a driver's license, you know, that's going to have your name and your picture on it. So any, anything that shows who, you know, your name, photo, birth date, you know, any and all of those things are going to be helpful to prove who you are. Okay. Um, and then people are going to need to prove how they entered into the United States. Yes. So what, what would that documentation look like? And that's going to depend on your personal situation. There are many people who are here who are currently undocumented in the U.S., but they entered legally. So if there's a stamp in your passport, or if you have that original I-94 card, or if you were in the U.S. and filed an immigration application, anything. So, so some people are going to have immigration paperwork that's going to say, you know, when they, when they got here. Um, for people who entered illegally the first time, that's going to be more difficult. They're going to need to have something that, that gives, especially for that key, you know, January 1st, 2010 date. They're going to need to show something that they were here before that January 1st, 2010. Yeah, and, and with that, that's kind of a... <clears throat> now, you said, it says you have to have been living here continuously uh, since January 1st, 2010. What, what does exactly that mean? Like, I could never leave even for a moment, a day? Well, and that's one, especially for that DAPA program, we're waiting for more information on. We know for DACA, they've said, you know, if, if you go back, you know, if you went back to Mexico for your, your grandma's funeral and you were gone, you know, for three days, Oftentimes that will be considered, you know, a brief, innocent, and casual departure. And that's one, if you've ever left the U.S. since that January 1st, 2010 date, it's going to be important to talk to a professional to figure out how immigration is going to look at that time period you were outside of the U.S. Okay. So, n not necessarily disqualifying you if you have left, but you need to check on that what kinds of documents can we use to prove that we've been here since January 10, 2010? And that's going to be... Um, a grocery receipt? Will that yeah, work? <laughs> that's going to be... It's time to use your imagination. <clears throat> yep, it could be um, rent receipts, mortgage records, um, medical records, employment records, bank statements, tax records, you know, church records, mm -hmm. school records, even if they show that, you know, you are listed as the parent, you know, for your child and that you were attending parent teachers conferences, um, any utility or phone bills, um, even if you don't even have that, some people have used emails or Facebook or social media oh, where, cool. where there's in as long as there's information that shows date and, and kind of a location of where you are um, mail canceled checks money orders if you got a money order and sent the money back home and you kept that receipt mm -hmm. that'll help prove that you're you know that you've been here Oh, lots of folks do that yes <clears throat> um, insurance if you property whether it's cars or you know anything and anything else um, even information from your employer. Mm. So like written documentation from yep. the employer can help. Yep, written documentation. And we talked a little bit <clears throat> about this in one of the other podcasts. Um, as long as you're applying for DACA or DAPA and your employer gives you information, immigration has given them a safe harbor that as long as there's no you know, history of fraud or that, that there's a showing that there's like a huge scheme going on with that employer, that employer providing information to you for purposes of DACA or DAPA is protected for that. 
good because that that's um probably the reason why most of the people that come to this country are here to be employed so that is probably one of the surest ways people can get information is from their employer um, but there are some barriers that could disqualify people from being uh, able to apply for these programs um, we talked about the arrest history or criminal history or contacts with deportation or immigration officials um, let's talk about what kind of documentation people have to gather if they do have some criminal history contact or immigration contacts. Yep, and if you've had contact with immigration or law enforcement of, it, of any type, mm -hmm. again, I would strongly recommend that you visit with an immigration professional to see how that affects your ability to qualify for DACA or DAPA. Now, if you've been arrested or charged or convicted of a crime, usually immigration wants to see any court certified document. So court certified document that shows what you were charged with and what and what you were convicted of. What if what if I don't have that document anymore? Is there a way to get a copy of that from the court? Most courts will allow you to request those records. Some some courts are easier to get those records than others. Is it take does it take time? In some, and it's one of those, it depends. You know, here, if you go to the Cass County Courthouse here in, in, in Fargo, you can probably get most of those records the same day if they're there. Now, many states only keep records going back for a certain number of years. So even if you know that you were arrested 20 years ago, you should still go to the court and try and get that information. And don't wait. And it, Yeah, and don't wait because courts are going to be especially in highly populated areas are going to be inundated with these requests. What if what if it was something that happened when I was a 13 year old? Even if it's a juvenile record, you still are going to need to get that information and figure out what's the best way to report that on your application. And even if you contact the court and they say, you know what, we destroyed these records five years ago, get that in writing that says, you know, we don't, you know, we ran, a, we, we ran a search on you, but we don't have those records anymore. You're going to, you know, usually you're going to want to get proof that they're, you're going to have to say, yes, I was arrested or convicted of a crime, but I can no longer get those records because it's no longer in the system. And even if you've had a case that has been expunged or dismissed or discharged you're going to want to try and figure out how to report those and what documents you can get so even if I had charges that were dismissed or expunged I still have to report that if I'm applying for DACA or DAPA yes because for the most part even if, if you have a criminal case that's been expunged by the state it still counts for immigration purposes. Right, so a lot of people that are listening, they might think, well, I'm not gonna have to report any of this stuff because my record was expunged, but that's not true. Yep, that's not, yep, and that because the expungement usually works for the state, not necessarily. So, but so okay, so I need to go collect any local arrest records that I have from my adulthood and my childhood, and that's it. Or is there other kinds of... Well, if Oh, you, immigration. You said that. Yeah, Im immigration. Yeah. If you were ever turned away at the border, if you were deported before, if you were refused a, a visa to come to the U.S., or if you've ever filed any paperwork here in the U.S., you're going to want to get a copy of those records. And that you have to do under the Freedom of Information Act, and those... Processes can take months, if not a year or more, to get. And you're going to want to make sure that with immigration, there's different agencies. There's the USCIS that would have any applications you filed. But then there's also ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, that will have some of the arrest records if you've been arrested. Mm -hmm. And then there's Customs and Border Patrol if you've been turned away at the border. Mm-hmm. And if you've had encounters with all three of them, then that's three different requests for three different wow. sets of information. And so, and okay, and then when, with the arrest record stuff, are we only looking for local? Um, 
records of arrests or... Immigration is going to, with all of these applications, immigration does, you know, a nationwide background search on you. So oh. it, it does, you know, so it's any state. Um, and so sometimes I recommend, you know, if you're, if you're not sure or if you don't remember if you were arrested someplace, mm-hmm. um, you know, to do a federal FBI background check. But even the federal FBI background check doesn't include some municipal records and Mm. and so that's one where you know if you know that you've been arrested or if you've lived in several different states but you're not quite sure you know what happened you might want to request not only those state records but also the federal records to make sure that you're not missing anything that is a lot of document checking that we have to do okay um what other requirements are there and, and now, you know, we talked about this a little bit before, but I want to talk about the documentation part. We'll start with DACA first. And there's documents that need to be specific to the application process for DACA. Yep, and the documents we were talking about before are kind of universal, whether it's DACA or DAPA mm-hmm. that you want to apply for. Now, for DACA specific, there's that educational component that right. you have to show that you're either currently enrolled in school, graduated high school, or have that GED. So if you ha- if you graduated high school, then you're going to make want to make sure that you get that high school diploma. Mm-hmm. But if you can also get your transcript or your attendance record from your school, that can help show going back to that showing that you've been here since oh. that 2010. Two birds, one stone. Yep. And so some of these documents you can you can use for for different pieces of that of the whole puzzle. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have that high school diploma, get that diploma. If you don't have that diploma, ask the school and, and get a copy of your transcript or your attendance and or your attendance record. Every school is a little bit different on how they do that. Um, if you have your GED, make sure you get a copy of that GED certificate. Um, if you're currently in high school or are currently enrolled in school. You're going to want to get something from your school or your educational program, whether it's a report card, class schedule, letter, something that shows that you're still currently in school. Mm-hmm. What if it's beauty school? Well, does it, it um, has to be high school? No, it doesn't necessarily have to be high school, although um, there are some requirements to show that it's that it's an authenticated accredited program right so so you have to check on that yep and and so if you're if you're just going to beauty school depending on what type of beauty school or even if you're taking online classes not all online classes are going to count for that educational component so again you know if if you're not enrolled in a traditional high school or you don't have a ged or you don't have a high school diploma you might want to consult with somebody to make sure that you get the right documents and that you're in the right programs. That's when you need to ask a question to yeah. somebody. Yeah, because one of those educational components, um, English language classes, do count if they're offered by you know an approved authority. Right. Okay. So let uh, let's 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 give folks your number. So if they have questions like this, they can call you. Tell us how people can get a hold of you. Okay. My telephone number is 701-298-7720. Okay, good. Now moving along to the, uh, did we talk about all the requirements that we need? I, I think DACA? For, for DACA, again, the, the specific requirements for DACA is going to be that educational component. Right. And then for DAPA, which is yeah, the parent. The, the DAPA and the parent one. That's one where we're still not 100% sure exactly what some of these requirements are going to mean. Again, need to show that you were here in the U.S. on November 20th, 2014. Yes. So if you were working that date, you know, keep your paycheck, go into your employer and have them write a letter that says, you know, John Doe was working on November 20th, 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, if you bought something at the gas station and used your credit card or something that has your name, mm. just something that can show that you were here on the day the president made that announcement. Um, you're going to need to have the birth certificate of that of your son or daughter, either showing that they're a U.S. citizen 
And if they're not a U.S. citizen, you're going to need to have a copy of their green card. Okay. Because you know, the requirement is to show that you're a parent of a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. So you're going to need to have your child's information to show, you know, are they a U.S. citizen? Are they a permanent <clears throat> resident? What if I had a child, but I didn't recognize that I was the parent at the time? I am that birth child's parent, but it's their name is not, my name's not on their birth certificate. That is one of the issues that immigration and USCIS is currently working on, is what, what type of documents are they going to accept or are they going to be looking for to prove that you're actually a parent of a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident? And that might be another one. If, 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 you, if you know you're not on your child's birth certificate, you might want to consult with a professional to be able to say what other options you know might I be able to come up with to show that I really am the parent of an American. Okay. Um, if if you um, were we're not quite sure yet if a step parent is going to count either, but if you think that you might qualify because you're the step parent of an American, you're going to want to make sure that you have a marriage certificate. Or if you've adopted a U.S. citizen child or permanent resident child, you want to make sure you have that adoption paperwork. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what other types of documentation issues might people have in dealing with the, um, the proof of them being parents? Immigration has talked about showing that there's a parental relationship. Mm -hmm. And so we're not quite sure at this moment what that means. Right. Whether or not a birth certificate is going to be enough or whether there's going to be something else. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a, call it a, a nice insurance policy would be, you know, to try and think about what documents that you have or paperwork that shows that you've had a relationship with that U.S. citizen child you might not need them but it wouldn't be bad as you're going through and looking at all your papers to see what you have whether it's photos you know again school records or something that helps show your relationship with the child with your child okay now i have a question here because as a, a former paralegal well i'm still paralegal but you know as a paralegal we used what's called an affidavit a lot when people didn't have documentation specific to what they needed to explain how there was a gap in their employment or in their education um, and and of course that's you know a certified affidavit is that something people can use in this process um, for DACA there are have, immigration has allowed affidavits for certain things now you can't have an affidavit to sh to meet that element of who you are. Right, right, right. Okay. And there are certain things where there's been a gap of time where, you know, there's a year of time that I can't prove that I was here. Mm -hmm. And in those instances, you can do affidavits from other people mm -hmm. and to explain why you don't have documents for that period. Mm -hmm. um, but, but they have to be really specific towards immigration language and the requirements for those affidavits that they're requiring. So again, if, if, you're try, if you need to rely on that affidavit, it might be a good idea to contact someone to make sure that, they're, that those affidavits are done correctly. Um, what else can you get affidavits for? Is there anything else they can use them for? Usually only um, for the continuous residence, you know, showing that you've been in the U.S. for, all, um, for how long that you've been here. Um, you can probably use them to show that um, you've graduated from high school, but oh. a, but again, immigration is looking for or more original documents. They're not just gonna, right. They're just not going to take your word or your neighbor's right. word. Right. Affidavits are usually used as a last resort when there's absolutely, absolutely no other documentation that you can use as a primary source. Yep. But it is an it is a possibility, is what I'm saying. Is yep, it, it is yep, a, it's going to be a, a possibility. Um, you know, for certain, you know, for certain of those things, um, 
And definitely you have to have an, a legal person and a lawyer involved in drafting these and, and, and getting them notarized. Yep, because the immigration has said, you know, even if you want to submit an affidavit um, to explain that you've continuously resided in the U.S., that there are certain requirements that have to be in that affidavit right. in order for immigration to even accept them. It has to be a legal affidavit. Well, it not only does it have to be a legal affidavit, it has to contain... The, the certain requirements that immigration has issued right. in or, even for immigration to accept them. So even if it follows the standard affidavit form that we would normally use, mm -hmm. doesn't <clears throat> mean it's going to meet the right. requirements that immigration, that, they're looking for. That, that immigration is looking for. Okay, now one last thing that I want to go over is even the documents that people do gather, if they're in Spanish, they got one more step to do, right? Yes. Because all documents in Spanish are not going to be legible to USCIS. Yes. If you have any document that is not in English, there needs to be a certified English translation. What does that mean? Again, immigration has... I do know what it means. I'm yeah. a translator, but I just want you to tell me... You yeah, it means that, for that, them. yeah, you need to make sure that you have someone who can swear and do a declaration that they are able to translate from whatever language it, it is in, like Spanish, into English, and that they've done a fair and accurate translation. And so just because you sit and say, yep, I'm going to translate my birth certificate into English, that's not going to be acceptable unless there's also that certification that it was competently translated. Does it have to be notarized? Um, generally speaking, if you can have it notarized, it's better. It's probably better. Mm -hmm. um, and, and generally better if it's not you translating your own document. Of course. And generally it, 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 better it, if it's not a family member translating. Yeah, it. and as a person that does translations and that ran a business doing translations and still does them. Um, I would r weigh in on this issue and say, get it done by a reputable company. Don't go to your neighbor. Don't have one of your kids that speaks English do it. In English, it, speaking a language is not the same as being to translate into that language. It, it is a skill. And when you're talking about documents that contain legal and you know, or medical or educational information, people can make mistakes very easily. So get it done right. It's uh, it's better to do it right than to have it rejected. Yes. and Or to have it accidentally contain the wrong information. Right. And one final thought is, uh, again, people, in addition to all of this stuff, will need to start saving their pennies. For their application, how much does it cost again? Again, the filing application for both the expanded DACA and the DAPA is $465. And again, that's just the money that you give to immigration to consider your application. Mm -hmm. That doesn't count if you, if you need certified copies or if you need to have those documents translated mm -mm. or if you need to come and see a professional like me even to screen and... and, and and look at whether or not you qualify. Or for the payment of, and of the gathering of those records. Yes. From wherever you're going to go get them. Yep. Well, that was a lot of food for thought. Thanks once again for coming and illuminating us on this issue. I hope to have you back here with updates and good news. Yes, we are, again, no filing for anything as of today, February 18, 2015. Right. Don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. Work on gathering those documents. Work on saving the money. You know, consult with an immigration professional. Don't panic. Things are going to be changing. We're thinking that at some point, we don't know when, we'll be able to file these applications. So stay cool and do your homework. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. This is Cindy gomez Shem, and you've just listened to a podcast of the People's Press Project. We will be hosting a series of podcasts discussing topics related to the President's announcement on immigration, which will be broadcast in English and Spanish. Please share them and help us spread the word. To find out more information about this or other podcasts and online media, visit our websites at fmppp.org, 
mexi-can.org or like and follow us on Facebook at the People's Press Project, Mexi-Can, and find us on Twitter at at media underscore PPP.